Hello, welcome to We Know Nothing, where we know absolutely nothing. And welcome back to Book Club. Still in Sophie's world, we are getting into chapter 10, which is called The Major's Cabin today. Now, if you haven't already, go watch the last video, the last chapter of Plato. Wow, what a just amazing, amazing chapter full of so many deep philosophical questions. So please, like if you haven't, you you need to go watch that and listen to that because dang. <laughs> but all right, let's just get into the major's cabin today. The girl in the mirror winked with both eyes. It was only a quarter past seven. There was no need to hurry home. Sophie's mother always took it easy on Sundays, so she would probably sleep for another two hours. Should she go a bit farther into the woods and try to find Alberto Knox? And why had the dog snarled at her so viciously? Sophie got up and began to walk down the path Hermes had taken. She had the brown envelope with the pages on Plato in her hand. Wherever the path diverged, she took the wider one. Birds were chirping everywhere, in the trees and in the air, in bush and thicket. They were busily occupied with their morning pursuits. They knew no difference between weekdays and Sundays. Who had taught them to do all that? Was there a tiny computer inside each of them, programming them to do certain things? The path led up over a little hill. They steeply, then steeply down between tall pine trees. The woods were so dense now that she could only see a few yards between the trees. Suddenly, she caught sight of something glittering between the pine trunks. It must be a little lake. The path went the other way, but Sophie picked her way among the trees. Without really knowing why, she let her feet lead her. The lake was no bigger than a soccer field. Over on the other side, she could see a red-painted cabin in a small clearing surrounded by silver birches. A faint wisp of smoke was rising from the chimney. Sophie went down to the water's edge. It was very muddy and in many places, but then she noticed a rowboat. It was, a drawn, it was drawn halfway out of the water. There was a pair of oars in it. Sophie looked around. Whatever she did, it would be impossible to get around the lake to the red cabin without getting her shoes soaked. She went resolutely over to the boat and pushed it into the water. Then she climbed aboard, set the oars in the rowlocks, and rowed across the lake. The boat soon touched the opposite bank. Sophie went ashore and tried to pull the boat up after her. The bank was much steeper here than the opposite bank had been. She glanced over her shoulder only once before walking up toward the cabin. She was quite startled at her own boldness. How did she dare do this? She had no idea. It was as if something impelled her. Sophie went up to the door and knocked. She waited a while, but nobody answered. She tried the handle cautiously, and the door opened. Hello, she called. Is anyone home? She went in and found herself in a living room. She dared not shut the door behind her. Somebody was obviously living here. Sophie could hear wood crackling in the old stove. Someone had been here very recently. On a big dining table stood a typewriter, some books, a couple of pencils, and a pile of paper. A smaller table and two chairs stood by the window that overlooked the lake. Apart from that, there was very little furniture, although the whole of one wall was lined with bookshelves filled with books. Above above a white chest of drawers hung a large round mirror in a heavy brass frame. It looked very old. On one of the walls hung two pictures. One was an oil painting of a white house which lay a stone's throw from a little bay with a red boathouse. Between the house and the boathouse was a sloping garden with an apple tree, a few thick bushes, and some rocks. A dense fringe of birch trees framed the garden like a garland. The title of the painting was... Berkeley? Jerkley? (laughs) Herkley? I don't know. Beside that painting hung an old portrait of a man sitting in a chair by a window. He had a book in his lap. This picture also had a little bay with trees and rocks in the background. It looked as though it had been painted several hundred years ago. The title of the picture was Berkeley. Jerkley. (laughs) The painter's name was Smibert? Mibert? Oh my gosh, these names. We're just going to go with Berkeley and Jerkley. Herkley. How strange. (laughs) Sophie continued her investigation. A door led from the living room to a small kitchen. 
someone had just done the dishes. Plates and glasses were piled on a tea towel, and some of them still glistening with drops of soapy water. There was a tin bowl on the floor with some leftover scraps of food in it. Whoever lived here had a pet, a dog or a cat. Sophie went back to the living room. Another door led to a tiny bedroom. On the floor next to the bed, there was a couple of blankets and a thick bundle. Sophie discovered some golden hairs on the blankets. Here was the evidence. Now Sophie knew that the occupants of the cabin were Alberto Knox and Hermes. Back in the living room, Sophie stood in the front of the mirror. The glass was matte and scratched, and her reflection correspondingly blurred. Sophie began to make faces at herself like she did at home in the bathroom. Her reflection did exactly the same, which was only to be expected. But all of a sudden, something scary happened. Just once, in the space of a split second, Sophie saw quite clearly that the girl in the mirror winked with both eyes. Sophie stared back in her in fright. If she herself had winked, how could she have seen the other girl wink? And not only that, it seemed as though the other girl had winked at Sophie, as if to say, I can see you, Sophie, I'm in here, on the other side. Sophie felt her heart beating, and at the same time she heard a dog barking in the distance. Hermes! She had to get out of here at once! Then she noticed a green wallet on the chest of drawers under the mirror. It contained a hundred crown note, a fifty, and a school ID card. It showed a picture of a girl with fair hair. Under the picture was the girl's name, Hilda Moller Nag. Sophie shivered. Again, she heard the dog. She had to get out at once. As she hurried past the table, she noticed a white envelope between all the books and a pile of paper. It had one word written on it, Sophie. Before she had time to realize what she was doing, she grabbed the envelope and stuffed it into the brown envelope with Play-Doh pages. Then she rushed out the door and slammed it behind her. The barking was getting closer, but worst of all was that the boat was gone. After a second or two, she saw it, adrift halfway across the lake. One of the oars was floating beside it, all because she hadn't been able to pull it completely up on land. She heard the dog barking quite nearby now and saw movements between the trees on the other side of the lake. Sophie didn't hesitate any longer. With the big envelope in her hand, she plunged into the bushes behind the cabin. Soon she was having to wade through marshy ground, sinking in several times to well above her ankles. But she had to keep going. She had to get home. Presently, she stumbled onto a path. Was it the path she had taken earlier? She stopped to wring out her dress, and then she began to cry. How could she have been so stupid? The worst of all was the boat. She couldn't forget the sight of the rowboat with the one oar drifting helplessly on the lake. It was all so embarrassing, so shameful. The philosophy teacher probably reached the lake by now. He would need the boat to get home. Sophie felt almost like a criminal, but she hadn't done it on purpose. The envelope. That was probably even worse. Why had she taken it? Because her name was on it, of course, so in a way it was hers. But even so, she felt like a thief. And what's more, she had provided the evidence that it was she who had been there. Sophie drew the note out of the envelope. It said, What came first? The chicken, or the idea chicken. Are we born with innate ideas? What is the difference between a plant, an animal, and a human? Why does it rain? What does it take to live a good life? Sophie couldn't possibly think about these questions right now, but she assumed that they had something to do with the next philosopher. Wasn't he called Aristotle? When she finally saw the hedge after running so far through the woods it was like swimming ashore after a shipwreck, the hedge looked funny from the other side. She didn't look at her watch until she crawled into the den. It was 10.30. She put the big envelope into the biscuit tin with the other papers and stuffed the note with the new questions down her tights. Her mother was on the telephone when she came in. When she saw Sophie, she hung up quickly. "'Where on earth have you been?' "'I went for a walk.' In the woods, she stammered. So I see. Sophie stood silently, watching the water dripping from her dress. I called Joanna. Joanna? Her mother brought some dry clothes. Sophie only just managed to hide the philosopher's note. Then they sat together in the kitchen, and her mother made some hot chocolate. Were you with him? she asked after a while. Him? Sophie could only think about her philosophy teacher. With him, yes, him, your rabbit. Sophie shook her head. What do you do when you're together, Sophie? Why are you so wet? Sophie sat staring gravely, gravely at the table. But deep down inside, she was laughing. Poor mom. Now she had thought she had that to worry about. Sophie shook her head again. Then more questions came raining down on her. Now I want the truth. 
Were you out all night? Why did you go to bed with your clothes on? Did you sneak out as soon as I'd gone to bed? You're only 14, Sophie. I demand to know who you're seeing. Sophie started to cry. Then she talked. She was still frightened, and when you're frightened, you usually talk. She explained that she had woken up very early and gone for a walk in the woods. She told her mother about the cabin and the boat and the mysterious mirror, but she mentioned nothing about the secret correspondence course. Neither did she mention the green wallet. She didn't quite know why, but she had to keep Hilda for herself. Her mother put her arms around Sophie, and Sophie knew that her mother believed her now. I don't have a boyfriend, Sophie sniffled. It was just something I said because you were so upset about the white rabbit. And you really went all the way to the Major's cabin, said her mother thoughtfully. The Major's cabin, Sophie stared at her mother. The little woodland cabin is called the Major's cabin because some years ago an army major lived there for a time. He was rather eccentric, a little crazy, I think, but never mind that. Since then the cabin has been unoccupied. But it isn't. There's a philosopher living there now. Oh, stop, don't start fantasizing again. Sophie stayed in her room, thinking about what had happened. Her head felt like a roaring circus full of lumbering elephants, silly clowns, daring trapeze flyers, and trained monkeys. But one image recurred unceasingly, a small rowboat with one oar drifting in the lake deep in the woods, and someone needing the boat to get home. She felt sure that the philosophy teacher didn't wish her any harm, and would certainly forgive her if he knew she had been to his cabin, but she had broken an agreement. That was all thanks he got for taking her on a philosophic education. How could she make up for it? Sophie took out her pink note paper and began to write. Dear Philosopher, It was me who was in your cabin early Sunday morning. I wanted so much to meet you and discuss some of the philosophic problems. For the moment, I am a Plato fan, but I'm not so sure he was right about ideas or pattern pictures existing in another reality. Of course, they exist in our souls, but I think, for the moment anyway, that this is a very different thing. I have to admit, too, that I'm not altogether convinced of the immortality of the soul. Personally, I have no recollections from my former lives. If you could convince me that my deceased grandmother's soul is happy in the world of ideas, I would be most grateful. Actually, it was not for philosophic reasons that I started to write this letter, which I shall put in a pink envelope with a lump of sugar. I just wanted to say I was sorry for being disobedient. I tried to pull the boat completely up on shore, but I was obviously not strong enough, or perhaps a big wave dragged the boat out again. I hope you managed to get home without getting your feet wet. If not, I might comfort you to know that I got soaked and will probably have a terrible cold, but that'll be my own fault. I didn't touch anything in the cabin, but I'm sorry to say that I couldn't resist the temptation to take the envelope that was on the table. It wasn't because I wanted to steal anything, but as, men, as my name was on it, I thought in my confusion that it belonged to me. I'm really and truly sorry, and I promise never to disappoint you again. P.S. I think, I will think all the new questions through very carefully, starting now. P.P.S. Is the mirror with the brass frame above the white chest of drawers an ordinary mirror or a magic mirror? I'm only asking because I'm not used to seeing my own <laughs> reflection wink with both eyes. With regards from your sincerely interested pupil, Sophie. Sophie read the letter through twice before she put it in the envelope. She thought it was less formal than the previous letter she had written. Before she went downstairs to the kitchen to get a lump of sugar, she looked at the note with the day's questions. What came first, the chicken or the idea chicken? This question was just as tricky as the old riddle of the chicken and the egg. There would be no chicken without the egg and no egg without the chicken. Was it really just as complicated to figure out whether the chicken or the idea chicken came first? Sophie understood what Plato meant. He meant that the idea chicken had existed in the world of ideas long before chickens existed in the sensory, sensory world. According to Plato, the soul had seen the idea chicken before it took up residence in a body. But wasn't this just where Sophie thought Plato must be mistaken? How could a person who had never seen a live chicken or a picture of a chicken ever have an idea of a chicken? Which brought her to the next question. Are we born with innate ideas? Most unlikely, thought Sophie. She could hardly imagine a newborn baby being especially well-equipped with ideas. One could obviously never be sure, because the fact that the, the baby had no language did not necessarily mean that it had no ideas in its head. But surely we have to see things in the world before we can know anything about them. Mm. What is the difference between a plant, an animal, and a human? 
Sophie could immediately see very clear differences. For instance, she did not think a plant had a very complicated emotional life. Who had ever heard of a bluebell with a broken heart? A plant grows, takes nourishment, and produces seeds so that it can reproduce itself. That's about all one could say about plants. Oh, so much more. <laughs> Sophie concluded that everything that applied to plants also applied to animals and humans. But animals had other attributes as well. They could move, for example. When did a rose ever run a marathon? It was a bit harder to point to any differences between animals and humans. Humans could think, but couldn't animals do so as well? Sophie was convinced that her cat, Shirkin, could think. At least, it could be very calculating. But it could reflect on... But could it reflect on philosophical questions? Could a cat speculate about the difference between a plant, an animal, and a human? Hardly. A cat could probably be either contented or unhappy. But did it ever ask itself if there was a god or whether it had an immortal soul? Sophie thought that was extremely doubtful. But the same problem was raised here as with the baby and the innate ideas. It was just as difficult to talk to a cat about such questions as it would be to discuss them with a baby. What does it... Why does it rain? Sophie shrugged her shoulders. It probably rains because seawater evaporates and the clouds condense into raindrops. Hadn't she learned that in third grade? Of course, one could always say that it rains so that plants and animals can grow. But was that true? Had a shower any actual purpose? The last question definitely had something to do with purpose. What does it take to live a good life? The philosopher, philosopher had written something about this quite early on in the course. Everybody needs food, warmth, love, and care. Such basic, basics were the primary condition for a good life at any rate. Then he had pointed out that people also needed to find answers to certain philosophical questions. It was probably also quite important to have a job you liked. If you hated traffic, for instance, you would not be very happy as a taxi driver. And if you hated doing homework, it would probably be a bad idea to become a teacher. Sophie loved animals and wanted to be a vet. But in any case, she didn't think it was necessary to win a million in the lottery to live a good life. Quite the opposite, more likely. There was a saying, the devil finds work for idle hands. Sophie stayed in her room until her mother called her down to a big midday meal. She had prepared sirloin steak and baked potatoes. There were cloudberries and cream for dessert. They talked about all kinds of things. Sophie's mother asked her how she wanted to celebrate her 15th birthday. It was only a few weeks away. Sophie shrugged. Aren't you going to invite anyone? I mean, don't you want to have a party? Maybe. We could ask Martha and Anne Marie and Helen and Joanna, of course, and Jeremy, perhaps. But that's for you to decide. I remember my own 15th birthday so clearly, you know. It doesn't seem all that long ago. I felt I was already quite grown up. Isn't it odd? Sophie, I don't, I don't feel I've changed at all since then. You haven't. Nothing changes. You just developed, gotten older. Mm, that was a very grown-up thing to say. I just think it's all happened so very quickly. And that is the end of the Major's Cabin. A little shorter chapter compared to Plato. <laughs> um, so, again, we are, we are posed with several very fun questions. Uh, what came first, the chicken or the idea chicken? So that really is getting into, well, of course, you know, the chicken and the egg. You have to have the egg for the chicken, the chicken for the egg, like they said. But, again, with the, the innate knowing, do you believe that humans have an innate knowing? Um, because you have this idea of a chicken. You're, you're imagining a chicken before it's even existed, right? Before it's ever been on this planet. And then you come to this planet, your soul comes to this planet, and it experiences what is a chicken. Well, the chicken is there. Was it an idea in your in the collective consciousness before it was created as a chicken in the physical reality? I mean, that. How do we know for sure? I mean, oof, oof, it really gets you thinking. So, if you believe in the ultimate consciousness, like the collective consciousness, the very um, essence of everything, essentially. And it, it's a conscious form, so it has to know things. So has ultimate consciousness, if that's what you want to call it, already known the idea of a chicken? Or was it, I mean, because if you're thinking of eternity, immortality, infinity, hasn't it always been and will always be and has never not been? So the idea of a chicken, oh, but... 
but why? <laughs> I always go back to why. I feel like why is the hardest question. Why is a chicken a thing? Why is a soul a thing? Why? <laughs> but then you get to that wonderful, juicy question of are plants, animals, and humans the same? Mm. Well, are they similar? Or what, what was the exact question? I don't want to get that wrong here. Ah, yes. What is the difference between a plant, an animal, and a human? So, yeah, what is the difference, right? Obviously, there are differences, right? You got a plant, an animal, a human. They're, they're all different. Everything's different. But can we, can we conclude that a, we are better than plants? We are better than animals because we have this, this you know, very awakened consciousness where we can, you know, really think about things. Like she gave the example of her cat. Can her cat think about the existence of a god or its immortal soul? But does that make us better? I mean, what does it really matter? Because it's still life. It is still energy. An animal has life. It, it does have thoughts and feelings and emotions. Plants scientifically have been proven to have um, kind of emotion-like things. Um, or, or they can feel things, right? They feel, in a sense, pain. Um, have you heard that when you, when you cut grass, that the smell of freshly cut grass is basically like the grass screaming, being like, I'm being cut. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's kind of weird, but plants are a living thing too. So yes, there are differences. Like a plant can necessarily think like a human. No. Well, at least we don't think so. We don't really know. That's the thing. Do we really know? How can we? The only, I think the difference is, is that the expression a human could express itself through its words, right? An animal expresses itself in certain ways, um, not necessarily through uh, language. Animals have their own language, though, in, in their own kind of way. But plants, they can't express themselves verbally, but they have a different expression. They are still life. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that when we treat human beings, when they treat plants and animals so poorly, just so, like, just with such disrespect. Yeah? <laughs> My dog is shaking over there. He's like, yeah, don't disrespect me. <laughs> um, it's really, it's it's kind of, uh, how do I want to word it? Mm, pointless? It's like, why? We are all connected to everything, not just human beings, not just souls. We're connected to everything around us because it is all, we perceive everything like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm just going on a rant. But seriously, why do we have so much disrespect for everything around us, plants, animals, anything? We, it, we should all be connected together and loving and harmonious, but I digress. <laughs> um, let's get on to some of the other questions here. So yeah, are ideas innate? Do we do we just have the, basically the knowledge of the entire universe already inside? Like all, just already in our soul? Hmm? Do we? I don't know. Why does it rain? Well, you know, I, I think it's funny that Sophie kind of was a little sassy about it. She's like, well, pfft. It rains because, you know, water evaporates and things like that. But then it poses that question, does it rain to give life to, to everything, to animals, plants, humans? Because we need, we need rain. Um, we need rain to water our crops. We need rain for everything. It's important. So then you start thinking about just all of the natural systems of the world. Why do all these things happen? See, we always go back to that why question, which is kind of hard to figure out. I think the why maybe is just to explore every possibility in the universe. Maybe. Hard to say. But, yeah, we, we need these systems to all flow together. We've got that natural flow. And if we don't have that, things are disrupted. And then humanity will cease to exist if it doesn't rain, I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, we kind of need that. Very important. And then... Um, what does it take to live a good life? That is entirely up to you. That is entirely your your perception of your own life. Like she, like Sophie said, you know, you don't need to win a million dollars in the lottery to live a good life. You decide what is good for yourself. What is good for the planet, what is good for your communities. 
that is that is up to you. That is not up to that is not up to society necessarily. You just have to decide what's good for you. What what are you good at? What do you enjoy? You know, like she said, don't be a taxi driver if you hate traffic. Just just that's the thing. It's like I feel like joy and happiness is sucked out of so much of of people's lives. Like oh, it just makes me sad. You know, we've we have become robots and I mean, even me, you know, I currently work at a job that's not my favorite thing. I'm definitely working towards getting out of it, though, for sure. But we have created systems for ourselves in society where we go to work, come home, go to work, come home, maybe take a couple of vacations, maybe barely be able to pay our bills, a lot of people. Um, That's just a whole nother tangent. But basically, you have to create your own happiness. You have to create your own good life basically like and there's going to be obstacles there's going to be challenges and we just we got to deal with it we got to go with the flow (laughs) um so yeah again you know also sophie she really is a rascal here going and and basically uh breaking and entering (laughs) and stealing she's a thief now um oh and then remember that mirror where she looked into the mirror and saw herself blinking with both eyes interesting Uh, basically just closing your eyes (laughs) um hmm very very interesting we'll we'll kind of figure out hopefully what that was all about but yeah next chapter is going to be aristotle so please stay tuned for that another great philosopher we're just going down the line of all the amazing philosophers so anyways think about those questions that are posed let me know your thoughts about them i would love to hear the thoughts in the comments uh wow all right well that was a pretty short fun chapter as usual we we just we discuss things right we don't really know do we really know the answers do you think that you 100 percent know the right answer of the universe if you do cool i mean hey good for you (laughs) But I don't know if we really always truly know, but maybe we do, but maybe we don't. Anyway, sorry. I'm just ranting a lot today. It's a, it's a ranty kind of day. But anywho, I hope you have a wonderful day. Please stay tuned. Also, if you would rather listen to podcast format, go to the uh, description below. We've got links for Apple, uh, Google, Spotify, Anchor. If you, if you prefer podcast format, all of these videos are in those podcasts. So, yep, if you like that, go to the description and you'll be good to go. Anyways, have a great day. Thank you so much for joining. Bye.